we've now talked about the concept of cross-validation, and it turns out that Scikit-Learn has some facilities built into it that allow us to do uh, these cross-validation procedures quite automatically. So we're going to do a, a live demo in code to show you how that works. I'm back in the context of the Python environment where we've loaded up our data, we've built some classifiers, looked at their performance, uh, and I've started an implementation here that is the same as what we've already looked at. So in particular, I've selected my inputs and outputs. Uh, my inputs to the model are going to be position and velocity data for each of the points on the infant's body. And we're making a prediction about uh, whether or not the robot is providing assistive movement. And, and if you recall, the the last uh, video where we were looking at performance of this type of model, we, we were doing not so bad. We built an, another instance of our classifier. The parameter set that I've chosen is identical to what we've already done. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and execute that. And, and now uh, let's use a new function here. And we've already imported this into our environment. The import statement is up at the top in, in the skeleton that we gave you. And, and what this particular function does is it accepts as input a classifier object and then takes information about uh, the training process. So I'm going to tell it what the inputs and the de desired outputs are. And then this other parameter, CV, uh, stands for cross-validation. Okay, this parameter here, CV equals 20, this tells us how many folds to cut the data into. Uh, so this cross-validation prediction function, it's going to do all of the data cutting for us, and it's going to train up the specified number of models. In this case, we're specifying uh, 20. And uh, then what it's going to do is uh, return a set of scores. There'll be one score for each data sample. But the important point here is that uh, because each data sample is used as a test uh, sample for exactly one model, the score that we get back corresponds to when that data sample is used in the testing process. So, so the very first sample in our array, that sample is the performance or is the answer that our model gives us uh, in, in which uh, the model was trained on folds one through 19. So we're using fold zero in that example as our uh, testing fold. So let's go ahead and execute that. And that will take a, a moment, depending upon how busy the machine is. And it actually gives us a set of, uh, of scores. And from there, we can uh, execute the same evaluation procedures as we've done already. So we're going to call our ROC curve function that takes as input the ground truth outputs and the set of scores. And then let's go about plotting our true positive rate and our false positive rate. So I've copied that plotting code from above. One thing that I did notice was that I had KS distance as the label here. Technically, this is just the difference between TPR and FPR. KS distance is the particular threshold. It, it is the distance at the threshold that maximizes the distance. Let me go ahead and execute that. And there is our, uh, our curve. And what you'll notice is that TPR and FPR are practically on top of each other. And in particular, our distance 
doesn't really change very much. In fact, it goes negative uh, for uh, part of the range of thresholds. One of the other things I wanted to point out uh, in the prior figure that I was showing, I actually had this labeled as KS distance. That's actually not a correct label. The KS distance is the maximum value of all the greens across all of the possible thresholds. So technically, this is just the, the difference or the distance between TPR and FPR. OK, so let's also look at what the ROC curve looks like with this data set. So here's the code that, that will generate that figure for us. And what you'll notice is that there is not much of a difference between this red dashed line and the blue line. In fact, the blue line drops below the red dashed line a little bit. If you recall, if we had a random classifier, we'd actually be sitting uh, along this red dashed line. So this is not all that great. Before we move on, let's actually look at the area under the curve. OK, and here's the code that will compute that area under the curve. And we're at something less than 0.5. So that's rather disappointing. So what's happened here? The fundamental difference between this and what we were doing before is that the prior set of figures that we drew were based on the performance on the training set itself. And here now we're looking at performance on an independent test set. So, so we had now a scenario where we've overfit our data and, uh, and now we're not performing well on, say, potentially future data. Okay, let's dig a little bit deeper into this and try to answer why this new set of classifiers is not performing very well. So, so here we're building our figure where we're going to look at the distribution of scores for the positive and negative examples. So there we go. Um, the, so remember the blue here are the positives. Those are the darkly shaded uh, samples or, or bars in the figure. Uh, and orange corresponds to our negative examples. And the thing to really notice here is that fundamentally these two different histograms are not really all that different from one another as far as uh, how they're distributed along the, the score axis here. And in particular, there really isn't a place where I can put a nice threshold uh, along the score that differentiates a reasonable number of the blues from a reasonable number of the oranges. So this is exactly why that TPR and FPR, why those curves sit really on top of each other, and why your ROC curve is uh, sitting right along that diagonal line. OK, so hopefully you're getting a sense of uh, the importance of being a little bit cautious and of making sure that we're using uh, independent data for our testing procedure. In this particular case, we really can't uh, solve this problem because we don't really have enough data. If we actually had data from a lot more infants, we might, might be able to build classifiers that can perform much more robustly on independent data. So what we're going to do here is turn to a slightly different prediction problem that we can actually pull some amount of performance out of. All right. Our new prediction problem, we're still going to use inputs that include both our position and our velocity data. But now, instead of uh, predicting motion uh, of the robot, uh, we're going to make a prediction about onsets of the motion in just the gesture cases. So those were those actions five, six, seven, or eight. We're, we're trying to predict when those actions actually start. We're not trying to predict the entire duration, just that, that instance of initiation. 
Otherwise, everything else is the same. We're building a, a classifier with some set of parameters. We're calling crossval predict in order to, uh, to do 20-fold cross-validation. And then we're computing the, the data for our ROC curves. So let's let that run. So that executed rather quickly. Okay, so here's the block of code for generating our figure. And so, so this is again comparing true positive rate and false positive rate as a function of threshold here. And, and what you'll notice is that instead of blue and red being right on top of each other, there is actually some amount of separation between the two. And in particular, this point right here, which is really near to point uh, to negative five, uh, that is the point where we maximize the, the difference between the two. So here we have a false positive rate around uh, point 0.4 and a true positive rate somewhere close to point 0.6. So let's go ahead and look at our ROC curve. And you'll notice now that the blue line is at least a reasonable distance away from the red dashed line. They're not on top of each other. And in particular, blue is not below the, the red dashed line. And here is our area under the curve. It's not quite 0.6. This is not something to get really excited about necessarily. Uh, but we do have a what appears to be a real effect here. Finally, let's look at the distribution of the scores. So here's the code that we generated to do that. Oops. Um, what, what I ended up doing here uh, was generating what appears to be just an orange distribution. If you look really carefully, there, there are some blues down in here. This is happening because uh, we've changed from all motion to just the onset of motion. So the true, the, the positive examples that we have in our data set occupy a very small number relative to the negative examples. Okay, so, so what we're gonna do actually, instead of generating a histogram of all of the negative scores, we're going to generate a histogram of a small subset of these. So I'm gonna go from zero to 10,000, we're gonna take every 50th, uh, every 50th uh, sample of these negative example scores. So the way we're going to solve this particular uh, problem is that we're not going to take all of the negative scores to bring those into the histogram, we're only going to take a subset. So let's take only up to the first 10,000, but we're going to take every 50th one. And when we do that, then the number of negative scores that we have is more comparable to the number of positive scores. And, and what we get out of this particular figure is that there isn't a whole lot of difference in the uh, orange versus the blue. In particular, there's, there seem to be two modes in, in both of those. Um, but there is a small set of positives right here that sort of sticks out and when we were actually looking at where to put our threshold, it was it was somewhere somewhere right about in here. But the the key is that we're getting these blue samples here on the right hand side of that threshold. So just that extra blob of blue uh, samples uh, sitting right here that's what's giving us this uh, blue curve here sitting above the uh, red dashed line. Okay, so this, this is still not the most wonderful example. We're actually dealing with a very small uh, amount of data. Typically, in a lot of our experiments, we're not working with just single infants, but, but actually working with tens of infants uh, and actually looking at data not just from one five-minute session, but, uh, but data drawn from uh, something on the order of 10 to 12 uh, different sessions. But nonetheless, we're actually able to 
construct a, a classifier that is able to nominally make a distinction between uh, no onset of this assistance movement and an onset of the assistance movement. Where we actually use this in practice is that we actually build classifiers that are even more specific. We look for uh, initiation of assistance based on power steering for the forward direction or the left direction or the right direction. So those are actually several different uh, classifiers that we end up constructing. And so next up, I wanna take a step back, talk a little bit more about the SGD classifier and about cross-validation. And then we're going to move on to uh, another type of uh, machine learning.